Welcome to our Sunday Tea and Archaeology at the Arizona Inn. I'm Bill Doley, the President and CEO of Archaeology Southwest. And I think we've got a really um, enjoyable presentation um, that's going to be coming up here today. Uh, I could go on for longer and longer, but we want to get Henry up here to uh, share information. He'll be talking to us today about Balcourt Societies and the recreation of the Hoacom in the 8th and 9th century. So uh, it's all Henry from here on. Thank you, Henry. Well, thank you, everybody. Uh, thank you, Bill. That was embarrassing. Um, <laughs> what I'm talking about today is sort of the thing that the research interest I've had from way, way back um, that's sort of come together in my head. So I'm, I'm going to put the story out to you. I'm not going to say I'm proving anything today, but at least I'll put the story out there and uh, uh, you can see what you think, uh, whether you buy what I'm going to say. Along the way, Bill mentioned that I'd worked on the ceramic chronology out here. One of the things that happened as a result of that work was we got a chance to look at the events of prehistory with, at a finer scale, and it meant that it brought a different view of how things happened in the past. And I'm going I'm to talk about what happened with that. One of the things that has always interested me about the Ho'okam is uh, think about what, what comes to your head when you think of Ho'okam. Is it ball courts like that? Uh, there's a whole range of, uh, let's see whether I can get this thing to go. Um, oh, that, we don't need that. Um, there's ball courts some of which are really quite impressive features. That's a ball court over there next to that house. There's all of these items of material culture that we know of as Ho'okam. These are sort of the things I think about when I think of Ho'okam. Spectacular items, uh, wonderful artwork. I've always been fascinated as to why all of this developed and spread over such a large area, how that happened. And so I'm going to tell you sort of the story of how I worked through the story that I'm going to tell you about. <laughs> Here's the premise of what, what I'm going to talk about today. Basically, the underlying idea is there were environmental problems in the 700s, which combined with social conditions at the time caused severe stress on Ho'okam society. And a lot of that stress comes around the use of water, of course. This is an irrigation society. They were dependent on water for for their crops. I believe that there was a revitalization movement, a type of cults or new religious movements that happened. It's a way to uh, uh, renew a society. And I believe that there were a set of sodalities that formed uh, as a result of that, that created, it was part of a new ideology that developed. So I'm going to tell you why I think this is the case. I mentioned the, the new chronology that we came up with. What happened was, for a long time, there had been a view of Ho'okam society as developing very slowly, gradually, almost glacial in speed, because there was a long chronology that Doc Howery originally developed. He didn't have all the, the tools that we have now, so he did, <coughs> did what he could with what he had. Uh, but the view of change when you only have gross categories of time, gross uh, periods of time, you can't see fine-scale change, you can't see sudden change. And what happened when we started looking at finer and finer increments, we found out that there was really rapid change at around AD 800. And that's when a lot of those traits that we were just looking at, the new types of material culture, the ball courts, and so on, came in over a very short period of time. And so that made it all the more interesting why this happened uh, suddenly and why it spread the way that it did. So these are the sort of markers we're talking about, the things that suddenly spread. Uh, I mentioned the ball courts. The way that the Ho'okam were burying the dead wasn't a total change. It just became much more elaborated, the, the ceremonies that they were doing around it. The sensors and pallets, call them stone tablets or uh, decorated stone bowls, which I think are actually related to um, the use of psychotropic drugs. These 
miniature vessels, the uh, Mexican mosaic mirrors that were coming up. There's Mesoamerican iconography that's coming up. There's a whole new iconography that the Ho'okam was using. All their designs changed very rapidly over a very short period of time, probably less than 25, 50 years in, in the lifespan of an individual. Uh, village structure changed. Before that time, there were plazas, but that plaza-centric village structure changed, and I'll show you how. I just put chocolate down there because you probably all heard chocolate came in. I have no idea when that started, but it looked like a good thing to throw in right now. <laughs> I hope they were having chocolate then. I like it. Uh -huh. I'm not the first one to suggest that something happened at that time. There's a long history of archaeologists recognizing that something happened in that general span of time, the, the, the span of time that was, that's called the colonial period. And likewise, that it, it involved a cult or a new religion. That's not a new idea either, but it was an inadequate explanation. Just saying that there's a new religion doesn't explain how, how things happen. You have to describe what that new religion was doing, why, uh, why it developed, and why it spread the way that it did. Uh, I spent a lot of time looking into how previous religions, how cults operated, to try and understand how it might have happened in prehistory uh, here. New religious movements, that's, that's the term that's used most often these days instead of cult because cult is, uh, as a term, gets used in different ways in everyday talk than what anthropologists tend to want to use it as. So. Uh, new religious movement sort of works a little bit better. There's some commonalities in how they operate. I think I put up there, yes, that most of them are oppositional. In other words, usually uh, the typical new religious movement starts with a charismatic individual who's not part of the mainstream of the religious hierarchy in, in the society, and they're doing things that are totally different than what the main religious belief systems are saying you're supposed to do. That's the norm, uh, but there are exceptions to that. It doesn't always work that way. In this case, Hokam society, you know, a typical village at the time period we're talking about, probably wasn't bigger than, oh, maybe the very biggest villages might have been 500 people. Uh, a village here in Tucson might have been 200 or less. So these are not, these are, uh, it's not high populations. And in societies of that size, you don't get oppositional movements. It just doesn't work. It's within, because it's a small enough society, it's going to happen within the existing ritual power structure. So I'm concluding that it's internal here, whatever happened. Um, this is important. When cults develop, or in this case, uh, I should say, I, I called it a cult here, new religious movement, um, they don't totally change things, uh, or at least the type that I'm dealing with here. What it's intended to do is transform the society to something better than whatever it is going on right then. They develop because there's stress. Uh, and you might be familiar with like the ghost dances of the, of the late 1800s, or um, well, there's, a, there's a long list of these all around the world. There were loads of them that, that happened as European societies invaded various parts of the world because people were looking for some way to get back what they had before European disease or conflict or whatever. There's several types of these uh, new religious movements that would occur. Sometimes they're intended to just go back to what it was before. Sometimes they're sort of a xenophobic variety where they just want to push out whatever's there. In terms of the Ho'okam, it makes the most sense for it to be a revitalization type movement. Like, if you've got an environmental stress, uh, you want to go back to where it was good before then. And maybe if your current, whatever the current ritual power structure, the folks who are in charge, the people who are interpreting the supernatural, aren't doing a very good job of it because things are falling apart, they need to find a way to go back to when it was working. There are lots of reasons 
why there can be change. I'm, I've sort of talked in general sense, environmental stress. That can occur because of various things. Uh, in this case, these are some of the things that could have happened in this area, and I'll say why I think they, some of them did happen. It's not a situation where an environmental disaster by itself is going to cause something like this. Uh, that's not enough. The people had been living here for thousands of years. There had been environmental uh, problems in the past. You know that there had to have been. So that's not it all by itself. There has to be other things that happen. In this case, you've got a society which had become settled on the landscape several hundred years before this time, around 500 AD. Uh, that's when they started uh, living in villages uh, where they were sedentary on the landscape and where they had uh, started building large-scale canal systems. Uh, and that's important. Once, once you build one of these large canal systems that's up, up on an upper terrace, like in the Salt River Valley or the Gila River Valley, you're sort of committed. You've got a lot of land that's under cultivation there that you're depending on. Your villages are set in place. And the relationship of various uh, villages, canal systems, whatever the social units there were there, is established uh, at that point. Land tenure had to be in place by then. When I say circumscribed zones of habitation and agricultural development, that's what I'm talking about. They've developed into the areas where they could. Even though there's not high population levels, it's growing. And let's look. So there are several ways that you can get at what might have happened. And one of the, it's sort of amazing really, there, there's been some just wonderful research. Some of you I'm sure have heard about, but doesn't get publicized a lot. You all know the tree ring lab here. Uh, there's a long tree ring chronology for uh, most of the Southwest. Back, well, it's been about 30 years ago, Don Grable and his colleagues, they realized that with the tree ring data, you can also get at the stream flow of the major rivers because the trees that you're getting the tree ring chronologies from are from the headwaters, or at least some of them were, uh, of the Gila and Salt Rivers. And there's a direct correlation between stream flow and annual precipitation and the tree rings. Uh, so they were able to look at tree rings and then go back in time and say what the annual stream flow was of the Salt and Gila rivers going back 1400 years, which is really pretty amazing. It's not something where you can say, in this year, there was a flood on August 25th. It's not like that, but you can say that in that particular year, let's say, that there was however much precipitation more than the norm, and therefore there may well have been flooding that year. Or perhaps more importantly, you can say that there was a drought. And that's, that's very important for agriculturalists, of course. There are differences between the Salt and Gila River, and one of the most important differences is that the Gila River has two things that are negatives. One is that the rains that provide most of the water for it tend to be there during the growing season. So if the tree rings are saying that there's low annual precipitation, or conversely, loads of it, it would have had a direct effect on the growing season, which is important. Uh, the Salt River, it tends not to be. So there might be time to, let's say, rebuild a canal or whatever. Plus, the Gila River doesn't have as much water. So if you've got a drought and you've got loads of people taking water out on their canals, you can run the river dry. And that's, that's a really big thing. I note at the bottom, the worst scenario is where you have multi-year droughts, especially those that are followed by catastrophic years of rainfall. And I'm not going to read this stuff, but it's there for you to see. This is just a summary of some of the bad things that were happening in the 700s. 700s were exceptional uh, for being really tough for agriculturalists uh, out here. And it's a combination of a of series of droughts as well as just enormous rainfall events. Um, the one, uh, what is it, 749? Yeah, it's either eight or nine times the mean for annual precipitation. I mean, it's, it's like nothing we've experienced in 
uh, modern times. As to what its direct effect was on the Ho'okam, of course, we don't know directly. And like I said, I think it's the droughts that are really the key here. And what's important is that there's a whole series of them. And on the Gila, that's serious. There's no way we can know what effect solar eclipses would have on prehistoric inhabitants here. Uh, some parts of the world, ethnographically, they're a big thing in society when they occurred. I'm just throwing it out here because there's uh, uh, Bruce Massey picked on, up on this. They're at several fair, fairly coincident timing with some of the worst events that happened in the 700s were total eclipses. One of these was a particularly long one. There would have been four minutes of darkness, which had to have been pretty disturbing for a society that depended on sun and so on. And, and the fact that it correlated with these other disastrous events makes you wonder anyway. So that's all sort of out there. Okay, there's these things that were happening. What is it? Where's the evidence? How, how can we do anything with that? There are some things that we can say. I've got a little bit of support for my story. <laughs> um, uh, and so I wanna, I wanna go through a couple of the things that I find most intriguing and you can see what you think. There's the most dramatic thing that happens, of course, is that you're getting this package of ritual traits that show up at that time. That's exactly the sort of thing you expect with a new religious movement. Something new that re really is changing the culture that's, that's when that happens. It's not just the new iconography on, on the pottery that's coming out of the middle Gila. It's also showing up on pottery that people are making all across southern central Arizona uh, and even off into southwest New Mexico. It's at this time that there's also a major expansion of the canal systems. So you have to ask, well, why then? It's not like there suddenly was tons more people. So going through a few of these things, here's the distribution of middle Gila buffware pottery. Now, buffware pottery is sort of part and parcel the marker of the Ho'okam. It goes everywhere where you see the other traits, uh, the ball courts, uh, these other ritual items that I've, sh I've showed you. And, and it goes a long ways. I don't really even show the furthest reaches of the distribution in this map. It's been found at shell middens uh, on the Pacific coast uh, by LA, uh, and it extends into New Mexico in the Membrace area. So it's, it's wide distribution. Its production source is primarily in one small area along the Middle Gila River. There are several other small production sources uh, along the Middle Gila, and then loads of areas it's getting copied. Uh, that's buffware. And one of the things we know because of the research here in Tucson is that, uh, I mean, you might ask, well, how do we know that they're copying it? And uh, it's not copying someone somewhere else. Well, at least here in Tucson, because of some of the excavations and work we've done here, we know that the designs that show up on buffler pots that are in context with local red on brown pots here the buffware pots have slightly more advanced, in the design sequence, they're slightly more advanced. They're setting the trend and the local decorations following. It's noticeable. Another thing, the pottery at this time period that shows up at AD 800, that's when you get, if you've seen much in the way of Ho'okam pots, there's all these little, um, geometric figures, there's life forms of one sort or another, people. That's when all that shows up. That's when it first, first, uh, uh, first shows up. And that's all encoding information. I mean, we know from cultures all around the world, this is, it means something uh, to the Ho'okam. It may be a subtle thing. If you asked a potter, well, what's, you know, what do those little things mean? Oh, they would just say, oh, that's just how we do it. But really underlying that, there's something that's part of the culture. Uh, it does mean something. This is just showing, this chart shows the sequence of styles, major styles, in southern and central Arizona. Prior to AD 800, this innovatively called style one was, and this is a, 
uh, in some ways it probably shouldn't even be called a style. It's universal. It occurs all around the world. Here it occurs prior to that time and it goes back thousands of years. In the western U.S. we know it goes back at least to about 8,000 B.C. And it uses uh, designs that are um, uh, considered by some to be shamanic. Certainly they're, they're things that are uh, hardwired in our brains. Uh, so at 8800, all of a sudden you get all of these interesting things that show up. And these designs still sort of get integrated into it, but you get, really get uh, quite a change. We're not going to worry about the later stuff. One of the things that I did to try and figure out what's the significance of uh, uh, the buffler pottery and it going everywhere was I, I did a little experiment with uh, looking at how much of it was moving by distance because there's different ways that you can look at exchange or, di or I should say the way people uh, trade and exchange things causes different types of distributions of pottery. So the first step was to get distances to uh, all the various sites that I had the data from and then I plotted it. It's a very simple graph bottom there's distance from Gila Butte which is sort of the center of where it's produced and this is just the percentage of buffalo pottery. So you can see that snake town right up there fairly high. I guess I've got the pointer. We know they were making buffalo pottery there. Likewise Gila Butte we know they were making it there. So these are producers up here. This is in the middle Gila in that both the production area and nearby. And as you go further away, you know, like these are some of the sites in the Tucson area. So some of this you could look at as just it's a curve, it's just a fall off. That's sort of like down the line trade, you know, you passing it from neighbor to neighbor, that sort of thing. Or it can be a redistributive thing, you know, you're going to festivals and you're exchanging that way, you still would get a distribution like this. The thing that doesn't make sense on this graph is the fact that it just keeps on going like that. It should just stop. Instead, it just keeps on going. And if we had the data, I know that it keeps on going past that. I just don't have the, the exact percentages to be able to plot it. That's interesting. The long tail says that there's something really important about that pottery that makes it so that everyone within that larger Hoacom sphere wants to have at least you know, a couple of pots in their village or one per household, that sort of thing. I did some modeling to see how many were in each household. And the ones way out at the end there, well, not every household might have had one, but certainly there were several pots in the village. That's saying something. And I should say, other uh, pottery that's being produced in southern Arizona does not do this. Uh, the whole come buffer is unique. Okay, so I think we've already gone over some of this. Basically, the most important part of this is it's saying that there's something about what information that pottery is representing that's important, it's special. And everybody agrees that it's special over a large area. So to the ball courts, that's the distribution of Hoacom ball courts here. They go everywhere where the pottery does, uh, uh, or, or I should say where the pottery is in any abundance. Um, there's some interesting things about it, and uh, that's probably not what I'm going to talk about. But <laughs> I had to throw it in. I mean, National Geographic can be very dramatic. <laughs> um, there's some interesting things about the ball court uh, distribution, and uh, I saw Dave Wilcox is here. He's the one that pointed out most of this stuff in a very seminal uh, uh, monograph many years ago. There are patterns in how they're oriented in some places, and a great example of this is the San Pedro Valley, where the early courts, the ones that date to probably AD 800 or shortly thereafter, the central one in the valley is oriented one direction. The two that are at the other ends of the valley are oriented at right angles to it. What's that mean? I mean, it's a pattern. We don't know what it means, but it suggests that they're a system of some sort. And as Dave pointed out back then, there, there are subsystems that carry all through the Hoakam area. And there are other localized patterns like this as well, some, some that uh, we've only become aware of since, since Dave's work because there's been new things discovered. 
and think about it. Uh, this is the ball courts. Uh, I, sh I should say they're they probably really are ball courts. Uh, there's some sort of game that's being played in them. Uh, for those of you who are not not that familiar with them, this is coming out of Mesoamerica, uh, where ball courts are a part of society long before the Ho'okam and, and continuing through this time period. They're not the same thing as what's down in Mesoamerica, but there's something that's coming from ideas that came up from Mesoamerica, and they're just part of a whole range of things that were coming up. I mentioned the new, ho the I the new iconography on the pottery. Some of that is parallel parallels what's in West Mexico. The ball courts, there's some almost direct evidence of the type of game at one of the courts in the San Pedro. Uh, I didn't bring the picture, Dave, so I'm, I'm sorry I can't show that. I have a great picture of Dave holding one of these stone paddles that were found, loads of them, around, uh, around and inside one of the ball courts there when it was excavated. They look like ping pong paddles, but they're made out of stone. Uh, so there's some sort of game that's involved with that. And Whenever you have games, that means you have people coming together, and they're a great way of linking uh, social groups. And think about it, if you've got a, something new that's motivating people to make something like this, what, what a great way to tie people together. I mean, you, know, you get everyone together in the village to get out there and build the thing to start with, so everybody's committed at that point because they've put hard labor into it. And then you've got people getting together after that time. And it goes, it goes along with the ball courts are part of a larger thing that relates to the structure of the, the villages. And we'll talk about that. This is a little bit of, it's hard on my eyes, the way this figure is put together. So I apologize for that. But let me tell you the important part. So this is the way we think villages are organized uh, in a gross sense at about between 800 and, and 900 AD. There's the ball court. Uh, it's right off the side of a plaza. Around the plaza, if we just looked at the ground surface today, we'd see a, a ring of mounds. And those are marking residential groups, households, uh, and perhaps larger social units around. Uh, there are cemeteries that go with those larger social units. In the plaza, there are cemeteries that indicate that the whole village is involved uh, with at least some people. We don't fully understand how that works, but it, it's saying that there's something related to the ancestors that's important uh, for the village. And there's also, and I think, uh, uh, I think this was true at many of the larger villages, there's a special, at least one mound that's capped or uh, specially constructed. What those are used for, we don't know exactly. You know, they're probably, you know, town, uh, when there's something important to be announced, you go up and stand on that and talk to the people. Back to the ball courts. Notice the ball courts right next to a, that's a large uh, pit oven used for uh, uh, cooking agave, which agave hearts are a great uh, feast food or you can make a great alcoholic beverage from them. Uh, so either, either way. And there's oversized ones that are next to the plazas. So there's a structure here that's set up at this time. And with the ball courts, okay, you've got a, you've got a reason for people to come together. You've got perhaps trade fairs of some sort, some sort of exchange that goes on. And I don't think it's just with the ball games. Uh, it's probably with other types of ceremonies as well. I guess the point I'm trying to make is that there's a package of things that show up. Now, why would this suddenly spread over that really large area? That's what actually was really bothering me as, as I looked at this stuff over the years. So I looked at what are, what are the ways that that can happen, and these, these are some of the ways that we know that items like this can move around. I'm not going to just read them to you. That's our premise again. We'll skip that. I think a revitalization movement is the only thing that I've been able to come up with that can account uh, for this. When I originally looked at this back in the mid-90s, I thought, oh, you know, a new religion, that would do it. But for just a religion developing per se, 
religions do not spread quickly. Um, the, at least, and I'm taking the word of several sp specialists who uh, have studied this sort of thing, uh, the time frame doesn't work for just a new religion starting and it develops. You have to have something that happens that uh, stimulates it in a very quick way. And in this case, I think it starts as a revitalization movement where there's transformation of the society. It's because things were bad, the people who are in charge don't want to get, get their heads knocked off, and so they realize that they've got to change something. So they come up with a new way of doing it. And there's a great uh, uh, parallel to what I think happened. It happened in the northern Midwest, the uh, Chippewa and some of the other tribes. There was a movement, I don't know the proper way to pronounce this, but the uh, Midewiwin, which is a, uh, it's also called a medicine society. There was a whole group of these that developed in response to the Europeans had come in and the existing power structure there was based on fur. And when the Europeans came in, instead of the appropriate people in society being in control of it, all of a sudden the Europeans would connect up with some of the, some different people there, and the wrong people were getting power and uh, so on. It wasn't going right. So the people who had been in charge all got together from the different groups and developed this new organization, it's a sodality, that came up with its own whole ritual system, it came up with its badges, its own insignias and everything, and they totally changed the ideology, but it made it so that it all worked again. People could buy into it and say, yes, this is how it should be. And that's sort of what I think is happening. I'm calling it the ball court society because the ball courts are the most obvious thing we see. They're sodalities like I'm talking about. They're members only. They're, they're private things. You get invited into it. That way it's, it's controlled somewhat by those who are in charge. It, it has advantages though to everybody because if you get things stable again, then everybody can be happy instead of it all being total chaos. What's important here for the Ho'okam Think back to what I said at the start. If the Gila River is running dry and everybody who's got a canal on the Gila River wants that water, that's a problem. Uh, there's gonna be conflict. And so there's a great motivation there to find some way to regulate it so that everybody doesn't try and irrigate their crops at the same time and run it dry, or the, the people down at the end, end of the line don't always not get any water there's a great motivation and it's, I think it's interesting that Snake Town, it's not up at the top end of the Gila on the middle Gila, it's sort of in the middle. And yes, there's a lot downstream, but they would have been potentially at risk. The Snake Town site itself, I think probably, or somewhere right in that area is where this started. There are some things that we could say that are probably the symbols of this uh, new cosmology. And this is one of them, the shiny things. That's Gila Butte, uh, which is, has these very large mines, uh, prehistoric mines for micaceous schist. It's what was used in the pottery. And it also gets used for, for some types of artifacts. Micas of various sorts are used as uh, uh, to make pendants. Pallets, those, those stone tablets, are made out of phyllite usually, which is a very shiny stone. There's all these shiny things. <laughs> it's been pointed out by uh, several researchers that it may represent water, uh, which I think is probably correct. The use of these shiny objects starts up in the Tucson Basin right at 800. It goes through, when the ball courts are done, it's gone. Um, there are also some other things here. I think it's, it's very interesting. The, I put the calendrical associations of Snake Town Plaza to the winter solstice. Uh, on the winter solstice, the sun rises over between the hills of Gila Butte and it sets over Pima Butte. And those are two of the buttes that are the mica schists that they're using. They may have actually intentionally put the site where it was. We don't know whether this occurs at other sites, but uh, from Dave's work with the Snake Town data, there's this association of orientation of houses with the ball courts at Snake Town. 
Then I think it's really interesting, there's a whole range of things in the Style II iconography on the pottery and in rock art that incorporate some uh, things that are probably mythological scenes and other scenes. I'm just going to show a couple of them. And there's some of you here in the audience that have all sorts of ideas about other things <laughs> that you can talk about too. <laughs> um, this is one of them, the bird attack snake scene. And I'll point out from the start, these things I'm going to show, they're not, it's not a recreation of something that occurs in real life. Yeah, yeah birds do attack snakes, but they show on the whole com, you'll find things like uh, what look like songbirds attacking rattlesnakes or water birds attacking rattlesnakes. That doesn't occur. That's not a real life thing. It's signifying something in, uh, I can't tell you exactly what it is. We could speculate very easily because rattlesnakes mean all sorts of things to, uh, and birds represent all sorts of things as well, but I won't, won't go into that. That pot is a membrace pot. Uh, it shows that this same uh, whatever it is, myth mythological ideas or uh, uh, part of the culture was also occurring in the membrace at that time. And there's other things in membrace that, that uh, indicate uh, Hoakam ideas were important there. And there's also this snake-eating toad theme that occurs. And again, th these are rattlesnakes. I mean, you can see the rattle on, uh, on the snakes. Rattlesnakes don't e eat toads. Uh, they, they like, like little birds and little fuzzy animals, so that's not a, a real-world event. And what's interesting is these things occur in different types of material culture. This uh, snake-eating toad theme is primarily on these stone sensors that occur in mortuary contexts. So it, this is related to death somehow. The bird and snake one is not. It's in a variety of contexts. And I'm going to stop here and just summarize and say, I hope you'll buy a little bit of the story. And if not, at least you've seen a few pretty pictures. So <laughs> and I'll stop there and I'll be happy to take any questions. Oh, it's possible. I mean, you do get quail on Hoakam uh, pottery, but they, uh, there's about, oh, maybe uh, eight or ten of these pots that I know of that have that, and there's, there's probably 50 or 100 sherds that we have of, of this now, and they show all kinds of birds. It, 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 th there's a full range from water birds to little song birds and to things that look like pelicans. Uh, it doesn't seem important to them what, uh, uh, there's even one that uh, they look like the birds from hell, I mean, <laughs> on one of them. <laughs> so I, I, I don't know. Yes? Yeah, I don't think I was real clear on that. I think what, what, what happens is it's, it starts as a revitalization movement. Uh, that's the thing that kicks it off. Uh, something to make things better in society. That progresses and develops into what I think are these sodalities, which carry their own ideology, which I think that, that ideology um, there becomes a new religion that develops out of that, but I think that takes time. Uh, does the word religion refer to a, a formal religious practice, or is that a broader uh, perspective of the society? Or? 
I think most people, when they use that term, they, they're, they're viewing it as something that, that is. It's pervasive in society. Um, and, you know, quite frankly, it's very, very difficult to document archaeologically. Um, we can document the ritual practices that are probably part of religion, but uh, that's, and, and we can get at the, the bits and pieces here and there. I've been working with uh, mortuary data, for, Bill would say forever lately, um, and there's all sorts of aspects of uh, the way that they're dealing with burials that I think give hints at, at religion. But that's all it is, you know, you, you can sort of get the separate little pieces. Um, and to get back to what you started saying, um, you know, I, to put sort of a positive spin on it, um, this, this worked for Hoakam society. I mean, we have like no evidence of warfare uh, during the span of time that uh, uh, this style two and the ball courts w were in use. Uh, there may be, um, as at the later end of it especially, uh, this is something Dave Wilcox has been working with, there may be warfare related to groups to the north. But within the Ho'okam, um, we, don't, we don't see any evidence of it. It occurs later. Uh, it, it was working to tie the society together. Uh, seems like we could use a little bit of that today. <laughs> There's, a, there's actually a fair period of time, I think, between the two. Um, uh, I think in most areas, I think the ball courts fall out of use somewhere in around AD 1050 to 1070. Uh, there, there is a rationale for thinking that there's some ball courts that um, uh, went later along the Gila and Salt. I'm still not quite convinced of that but I'll accept the possibility. Um, platform mounds, there's, um, there are these uh, features that occur right, they show up right in the mid 10 hundreds. Uh, there's one at Snake Town, there's one at, out in Gila Bend that, um, the one at Gila Bend becomes quite elaborate and, and looks like it may be the start of a platform mound, but most of the platform mounds don't get going until, oh, a couple hundred years later. Uh, so there's a gap there. Um, for what happens at that time, there's, a, there's definitely major upheaval that occurs somewhere between 1070 and, and 11, uh, say 1125. Uh, that's the, there's several ways you can go at looking at environmental problems in the region. One was the way I showed. Another is you can go out there and you can put trenches uh, across the river valleys and see whether you can find evidence of downcut river channels. Uh, and that's been done along the Gila. Uh, and the only prehistoric event that they found, uh, I, Give me, I don't remember the exact date, but it's like the early 1100s. Uh, there was a major downcutting event, um, but there may have been others earlier uh, that got washed away. Um, as as to what exactly happened at that time, you know, I'm I'm still not willing to commit. Uh, I know that uh, whole social systems reorganized uh, across across the region. Here in Tucson it did, in Phoenix. In Phoenix the, it's less, less so because you're circumscribed there, you're stuck where you are in the landscape with your canal. Uh, here in Tucson there was a little more flexibility, but um, things, things changed drastically and I'm, I'm, I'm not willing to That's commit. Um, it yeah, there's no reason to think that uh, the overall, like there's new people or whatever right then. I, is that what you're asking? Or not just people, but things like the pottery. 
uh, the pottery definitely continues continues on. There's a uh, there is a new style that's developing uh, that came in uh, a little ways before all that uh, change, and then it is changing again at that time. I and mean, we could run down a long list of the things that happened that changed then, but uh, I don't know. I'll let somebody else come up with the idea. There's 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 various thoughts out there on what's happening then, and probably the most the most uh, common view right now is that uh, there um, was increasing political differentiation at that time. The, the society is getting more complex, and that people were um, uh, some were becoming more equal than others. Right. Mm -hmm. There are patterns. It's not a. They're not absolutely rigid patterns. Um, uh, for example, the. Uh, well, I mean, there was a gross pattern that was seen early on, where these later courts were viewed as being uh, uh, primarily north-south, while the earlier ones were east-west, and that that doesn't hold uh, across the board. But um, there's there's not. Yes, there are preferred general orientations, but it's not rigid. Let me put it that way. And size-wise, um, the there's a set of courts that are quite large, larger than about 50, 55 meters. Uh, so they range from about 50 meters to 65 meters in length. Uh, and those courts uh, I think are exclusively early, the 800 to, to 900 time frame. The later ones, small. There's some small ones early too, but I think the size after that time relates more to the the size of the population that's l using it. Quite frankly. That's right. I believe it's within the existing. And uh, using the term revitalizing really implies that they're putting it in to, to vitalize again something that's there because of it. Mm -hmm. So if we see those kind of conservative movements every day, we want to uh, get back to the way things were in the 1950s or whatever it was. But here, Some of it is. A lot of it's internal, I think. Okay. But, I mean, because this is an, an age-old question about the Holocaust, what, given your theory, how do you now look at the social and perhaps human interactive implications of all of that sweep of outside things coming in to what you look at? So how, how was that integrating into it? How, how was that? Mm -hmm. um, what I think was happening, there had been, I think, long time before that, there had been contacts south. I don't think um, that had changed. I think the nature of the contact may have changed. And uh, there's a... Uh, Anthropologist that uh, wrote a series of uh, books uh, quite a while ago now, uh, Mary Helms, who uh, uh, talks about traveling for power. And her first work was with uh, Panama. There's a, a whole set of these societies in the major river valleys along the Panama uh, coast that uh, the, the chiefs of these societies would travel south uh, a long ways to essentially study and draw power or draw, basically draw information is what it is, uh, 
from separate cultures and then he'd bring back these little gold uh, frogs and other things with them as sort of symbols of what they did. And it, it gave them tremendous power within their local society. And there's this, what Mary Helms did, was she, she started with that, but then she started looking through history and around the world and realized that occurs all over. People uh, do this, and it, it happened here even in historic times with Kino. You see, uh, when he was traveling through, you would get uh, a chief traveling uh, 200 miles to see him. And I can guarantee it wasn't just to get baptized. It was, uh, there was more to it than that. Um, and I think with uh, the Ho'okam at this time, it would have been a perfect time for one of these uh, ritual specialists to have uh, followed whatever their traditional paths were down in West Mexico and to seek uh, something that would help them. Because uh, they were in crisis. I mean, you know, I, I, you know, I mean, there's historic accounts of the Pima killing shaman when, when things didn't go well. Uh, and I think their, um, their society and, and themselves individually were, were at stake. And I think, I think that's how it worked. I think they went down, they would bring back uh, those, those mirrors that I talk about. I don't know whether you've ever seen one of these uh, in a museum somewhere. They are spectacular uh, items. They, anywhere from about this big up to about that big, uh, often slate, sometimes sandstone discs, and they have intricately linked together uh, pyrite pieces uh, that are carefully beveled to fit together for the, that's on the mirror side. And on the flip side, some of them would have these elaborate Mesoamerican uh, cloisonné designs. Uh, I mean, and they were in West Mexico. Uh, they were worn by people of, of importance. They've been found in burials. They're in, for example, in the shaft tombs in Nayarit. Um, bringing some, I don't know how they managed to get them to give them to them, <laughs> but <laughs> uh, somehow they were, there was the right contacts, and bringing something like that back had to have helped. Uh, and it's not that the Ho'okam were then suddenly adopting loads of Mesoamerican things in a direct way. Um, that doesn't occur, like for the, you know, the life forms and stuff that are on Ho'okam pottery. No, they're not the same as what you see in West Mexico. Uh, they they transform the things to fit their society. So it's not that they were necessarily coming back and saying, oh, we have to do things like those people down there. I think it's more, they had those symbols, they had the, um, the power that comes with being someone who's traveled like that, and which meant that they were listened to. And that let them develop something that that uh, could work. And you're right, it's not uh, a revival uh, per se could be viewed directly as we're going to do things exactly the way we did, you know, when I was a boy. Uh, no, I think it's more, it's revitalizing the culture. Uh, so it's, it's trying to come up with something that's uh, not too different, but different enough to to make everyone excited about it. And that's, that's what that uh, 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 Chippewa example, that's what they did. Mm -hmm. So to follow up on that, Henry, it sounds like it worked in terms mm -hmm. of like did the stream flow and stuff. Is life a lot better in terms of doing irrigation and stuff in, in the next century? Um, well, they seem to have done, did it work, you know? well, it did work because yeah. uh, they were, uh, they did quite well for, uh, uh, well, we're talking 800. The first things that really s started going south were, were not until probably the 1100s. So maybe the late thousands. By luck or design, it worked. Yeah, it worked. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
Um, I guess I don't know ball courts at Chaco. There, there's, um, uh, in northern Arizona, uh, there's a group of courts that are, are late and I think generally unrelated to what I'm talking about here, like up at uh, uh, Winona, uh, up in uh, Sunset Wapaki National Monument, that area. Um, West Mexico, um, there are many courts that predate uh, the Hoocam and probably continue in. Unfortunately, we're dealing in Me West Mexico with lousy chronological control. And there's a lot of work that needs to be done there to know exactly how the courts there come up and relate directly. I don't know, Dave, you might be more with it on that than I am right now. Yeah, I think, I mean, the, what we do know is that the ball game continued and went up into historic times uh, in, in West Mexico. Um, so th there's that, but I'd, I'd like to, I'm still sort of would like to see more in terms of, uh, my, my guess is that the courts do carry up to this time in West Mexico, but I can't say that for sure. And I think David mentioned uh, in, in his work from a long time ago that uh, it's, it's the idea of the game that comes up is probably the single most important thing. And no matter what, they would have seen uh, potentially the courts down there uh, if they would have traveled down there. So, but it's not, I think that National Geographic view, it even showed the hoop on the side of the court. They didn't have that here. <laughs> it's, not, it's not like that. It's a Hoocom version of whatever. Uh, and, I, and I think there, there actually, I think there were different games even, because some of these, some of the ball courts are tiny. I mean, uh, they're little things that you might be able to put four people in, you know, <laughs> to play. And some of them are very large where you could do a lot. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, well, there's, there's significant change at 800 that I've been talking about. And then there's, there's uh, uh, the style, style three comes in a little later than, I mean, it's, it's in that 900 to, uh, to 1,000 time frame. And it, it's, it's a different phenomena. It doesn't occur the sa same way, and it's not associated with things the way that style two is. You don't get a sudden influx of changes in society that we know about. Uh, so it's a very different thing. It's, it's more like, um, uh, I don't know, there, <coughs> there's, we could probably come up with some examples in modern culture where new ideas just took hold. That, that's sort of the, the impression I get. Uh, <laughs> and some of it may be that some of the aspects of uh, the ideology was changing. I mean, it was evolving and they didn't, maybe some of the, all those little geometric figures and stuff, some of that stuff just didn't, didn't cut it anymore. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Thank you.